This is section 2.3, which is polynomial functions of higher degree with modeling. We're going to talk about graphs of polynomial functions, m behavior of polynomial functions, zeros of polynomial functions, intermediate value theorem, and modeling. Okay, so each monomial in this sum so is a term of the polynomial. So a monomial is when you have one single term and they're all being multiplied together. A polynomial is written in this way with terms in descending degree. So if you had like 3x to the fifth minus 2x to the fourth plus 3x plus 1, that is in standard form because your degree, so the power, is in descending order. The constants are the coefficients of the polynomial. So you have numbers that are with your degree. So the numbers out front, okay, these are your coefficients. And the leading term is the value that is connected to the highest degree. So in this example right here, the degree is five, the leading coefficient is three. Okay, so example one is graphing transformations of monomial functions. So it says to describe how to transform the graph of an appropriate monomial function, f of x equals a times x to the n, into the graph of h of x equals negative x minus two to the fourth power plus five, and then sketch to compute the y-intercept. Okay, so the first thing that we want to do is we want to talk about our original function was f of x equals x to the fourth power. So that's the monomial it's talking about as our appropriate original function, our parent function. So h of x, we have negative x minus 2 to the fourth plus 5. So that negative out front tells us that we're going to reflect over the x-axis. The minus 2 inside the parentheses mean we're going to shift right, oops, right 2. And then the plus 5 means we're going to move it up 5. So if we are sketching this graph, Okay, we're going to shift it to the right 2 and up 5. And then we know it's going to be opening down. So then, and an x to the fourth graph looks kind of like a quadratic, but it's more flat around the middle. This is not the greatest sketch. So again, we can go to Desmos. And we can type in negative x minus 2 to the, oops, fourth power plus 5. So we can see this is our graph and then we can move it around. We can see that our, our y-intercept is at 0, negative 11. So again, we could solve this algebraically, but you can also visually see it on a graph. And again, we can see that the x to the fourth is looks like kind of like a parabola, but it is a little bit flatter at the vertex. Okay, so if we go back here. We know my graph's not great. <laughs> we can edit that. And we know it's going to cross further down here. Again, hard to graph, but our y-intercept is going to be at 0, negative 11. Okay? So this is some pictures of different values we could have for cubic functions and quartic functions. So there's a lot of different variations of what they could look like. They could be like steep in the middle. They could have more um, 
more extreme local extrema, so more like having the um, local mins and local maxes more exaggerated, or they could be almost close to a line. So these are all our different variations. So the local extrema and the zeros of a polynomial functions. So a polynomial function of degree n has at most n minus 1 local extrema and at most n zeros. So example is, let's say I have f of x equals 3x to the 4th plus 2x squared minus 1. Okay, so the fact that this is degree 4, that would mean I would have at most 3 local mins and maxes, and I would have at most 4 zeros. Okay, we're going to talk about how you could possibly have complex zeros, so you might not have all four, but that's the most number of zeros that you could possibly have. So this is talking about leading behavior. So we've talked about leading behavior in Algebra 2, but this is giving a new form of notation. So I'm going to highlight this right here and make it bigger for you. So this says like on this first example, so this would be odd and positive. This would be odd and negative. This would be even and positive and even and negative. So when we say odd or even, we're talking about the degree. And when we say positive or negative, we're talking about the leading coefficient. And then when we describe n behavior, they want you to use the limit, um, the limit notation of this. So, for example, odd and positive, you would say the limit as x approaches negative infinity. So that's telling you as you go to the left. So anytime you see negative infinity, that means as I go to the left, my function goes down. So it goes to negative infinity. Whereas if we go right here, I'm going to blow that up here. So this is as the limit as x approaches positive infinity. So that means as my function goes to the right, my function goes up. So it'd be my function goes to positive infinity. So you're paying attention to those negatives and the positives. So odd and negative. As your function goes to the left, it goes positive, and as it goes to the right, it goes negative, so it's switch, switched. And then even and positive, it's going to go no matter to the left or the right. You'll notice both of those um, end behaviors are positive, and here both of our end behaviors are negative. So those are your different end behaviors depending on your leading coefficient and your degree of your function. Okay, so our next example says to describe the end behavior of 2x to the 4th minus 3x cubed plus x minus 1. So what I notice here, first of all, the 4 means this is an even function, and the 2 is positive. So this is even and positive. So I follow that even and positive. I know that they're both going to have an end behavior that's ending up. So that means I would say the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x is positive. And the limit as x approaches positive infinity of f of x is also positive. So that would be my end behavior of this function. Okay, so our next one is finding the zeros. So this is using factoring. So if I look at all three terms here, I know they're all even. So that means I can factor out a 2. And I see that they all have an x in common. So I'm going to factor out a 2x. That's going to leave me with x squared minus 2x minus 3. And then I'm going to set this equal to 0 because I'm finding the zeros. So then in the quadratic left inside the parentheses, I can factor and say, okay, what well, multiplies to negative 3 and adds to negative 2? So that would be x minus 3 
and x plus 1. So that would mean that my zeros are what make each part of this equal 0. So the 2x would be 0, the x minus 3 would be positive 3, and the x plus 1 would be negative 1. So those would be my three zeros for that function. So multiplicity of a zero occurs when you have more than one zero repeated. So if you have like x minus three is a factor multiple times, then three would be would have a multiplicity greater than one. So we're going to look at, in our next example, we're going to talk about what happens when we have a multiplicity. Oh, okay, so even and odd. So if you have odd multiplicity, even if you have multiple zeros, if odd multiplicity means you're going to pass through that zero. So it might level off, but it will still pass through whereas even multiplicity will touch zero and bounce off. So odd passes through and even bounces off. So that's where it says that your odd zero crosses the x-axis and then the even graph does not cross the x-axis, does not change sign. So we're going to look at that with this example right here. It says to sketch the graph of x plus 2 cubed times x minus 1 squared. So this means that our zeros, how we would write this, our zeros are negative 2 and 1. So negative 2 is, has a multiplicity of 3. So I like to write m3. And our 1 has a multiplicity of 2. So we're going to write m2. So that means that because negative 2 is an odd multiplicity, you can see right here, it levels off at negative 2, but it still crosses your x-axis at negative 2. Whereas if you look at 1, it has an even multiplicity, so you'll notice it's bouncing off of 1. So odd multiplicity passes through that point, whereas even multiplicity bounces off of that point. So the last thing is intermediate value theorem. And this is a whole complicated way of saying something that it's kind of like an obvious statement for us, but it says that when the y value changes from either positive to negative or negative to positive, that means that a zero occurred between those values. So for example, if I have a table, let's say I have 0, 1, 2, 3. So let's say I have the point 4, and then 12, and then negative 3, and then 7. So what this would tell us is that there was a 0 between the values of 1 and 2, and then there was another 0 between the values of 2 and 3. And that we can tell that because our y values are changing from positive to negative and from negative to positive. And that happens when we have our graph. If we're going from positive to negative, we know, oops, not positive to positive, positive to negative, we know that we would have a zero in between those values. So that's what the intermediate value theorem shows us. And this final slide just shows us a picture of that. So if we're going from a negative value to a positive value, that means we had a zero in, the, in between those values. So just understanding that the intermediate value theorem tells us that if we're changing signs of our y value, that our x had a zero in between those two points. So that is 2.3.